The bright side of addiction is recovery. And recovery begins with hope. If you're new to our podcast, we welcome you. And if you've been here before, (laughs) welcome back. Nice to have you here. If you're in recovery or know or love someone who is, or you simply want to know more about the recovery process, or maybe you're a bit concerned about someone you know or love who harmfully uses alcohol or any other drug, well, this is the podcast for you as we carry the message of hope and the promise of recovery. And a reminder, you can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. Now, recent episodes have included a great interview with musician Bonnie Raitt, NFL players Ryan Leaf, Thomas Hollywood Henderson. We've had some great authors on as well, including Brene Brown and Lamott and J.A. Jantz. Astronaut Buzz Aldrin joined us on Recovery Coast to Coast, and actor John Larroquette and many others, plus conversations with everyday people in long-term recovery, sharing their story, their insight, their path. Now, in this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, we are going to honor Mike Barry. Mike is a longtime friend and an American hero, a true recovery champion. He was a former television broadcaster in Louisville, Kentucky, He has a booming voice and an encompassing smile with a wild and wonderful sense of humor. Mike Barry was the CEO of PAR, that's People Advocating for Recovery. He also served on the executive committee of the Voting Rights Coalition in Kentucky. He was a member of the Kentucky Co-Occurring Advisory Council, the Substance Use Disorder Advisory Group of the Greater Cincinnati Health Foundation. He was a founding board member of Addiction Recovery Advocates of Kentucky, and also a founding board member and vice president of Faces and Voices of Recovery. I could go on and on, but suffice to say, he will be forever remembered in the recovery community. A giant of a man whose actions spoke louder than his words, and his words spoke really loud. I am really going to miss Mike Barry. Sadly, Mike passed away on February 28th. In the words of First Lady Jill Biden at the recent unveiling of the first-class postage stamp bearing Mrs. Ford's photo, Dr. Biden said, heroism is not perfection, it's resilience. And Mike certainly was resilient. Following a number of attempts at sobriety, Mike finally found what the path to long-term recovery was all about. Happy, joyous, and free. Here's a quick clip from the interview with Mike Berry. Overnight, we just don't decide to become happy, joyous, and free. We progress uh, into our recovery as well. And when we talk about relapse, I look at that the same way. We can progress into a relapse. But if we continue through the recovery process, we continue to grow. And each day, I'm amazed by new things that happened and new alliances that are formed and new attitudes for myself that I have and a new way of looking at things that I looked at in the past. And when I look back, my whole outlook on life was just totally skewed. And I look back at it sometimes with humor, sometimes with sadness, but think I just didn't get it. And as I continue to progress today and start meeting more people who are in long-term recovery, how important that is to continue and for us to speak out. My archive conversation with Mike Berry is coming right up, and I will share a poem I wrote about Mike called Agent of Change. I will share that with you at the end of the podcast. We'll also hear today from actor Lou Gossett Jr., who will share some thoughts on truth and trust in recovery. Our website is recoverycoasttocoast.org. And just as a recap, following 17 years of nightly broadcasting on iHeartRadio in Seattle, our podcast features interviews with everyday people in recovery, as well as clinicians, authors, and recovering celebrities, all who offer the promise of hope and the reality of recovery, plus well-vetted resources for individuals, families, and friends. We invite you to enjoy the podcast and would appreciate it if you share it with at least one other friend. Recovery is an American way of life. And if you'd like to help us out financially or know of a foundation that may be interested in underwriting our program, we would be ever so grateful. Our email address, recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. We'd love to hear from you. 
Recovery Coast to Coast, supported by Sundown and Branch, one of America's oldest, least expensive, and most successful treatment programs. When someone asks me where I would suggest a person go for addiction treatment, I usually give them three or four suggestions, but always at the top of my list is Sundown M Ranch. It's a not-for-profit treatment center located in central Washington at the mouth of the beautiful Yakima River Canyon. Why Sundown? Well, pretty simple. Their treatment is usually successful, and they have been successful for over 55 years. They're not a silk sheet facility. They're a good, solid program, 12-step centered abstinence-based. The staff has been together a long time because, well, they're well-paid and they love the success that emanate from their program. Many of them actually went through treatment at Sundown many years ago. There are two different things that stand out for me about Sundown. First of all, they don't just treat and release. They follow the patient back into the community. They equip them with the tools necessary to achieve long-term recovery. Many treatment centers are more interested in filling beds and staying full, not sundown. The second reason is that they are a founding member of NAATP, the National Association of Addiction Treatment Providers, which has very strict ethical standards. In fact, regardless of which treatment center you decide to go to or have a family member or a friend go to, be sure they're members of NAATP. There are a lot of bad actors out there that sell the sizzle and not the steak. Sundown uses an integrated system of care, including withdrawal management, residential treatment, outpatient services, and continuing care. Check out the website for more information. Take a look-see at their facility, which is not far from Seattle. Sundown M Ranch, where recovery begins. I'm pouring myself a nice big cup of coffee, as I remember a great man, a good friend, and a recovery role model who is indeed an agent of change. His name is Mike Berry. Sadly, Mike passed away on February 28th of this year, just a week before his 75th birthday. His legacy is one of hope and resilience. Uh, I want to share an interview that I did on Recovery Coast to Coast back in, gosh, 2011, shortly after he received the prestigious Johnson Institute America Honors Recovery award. Let's listen and remember and never forget the impact that one man can have in the lives of many. Welcome back once again to Recovery Coast to Coast, talking about addiction with a focus on recovery. We're going to go down to Louisville, Kentucky and catch up with a pretty fascinating guy. His name is Mike Berry. Mike is a guy in long-term recovery, and he was recently honored in Washington, D.C. by Faces and Voices of Recovery, that great organization that we talk so much about on the air. America honors recovery. And one of the people they honored this year was Mike with the Vern Johnson Award. Vern certainly being one of the pioneers in our field. And Mike is joining us tonight on Recovery Coast to Coast to talk a little bit about Mike and a little bit about an organization that he has been involved with. He is the CEO uh, of an organization called PAR. People Advocating Recovery. They've got an advocacy training center. We're going to find out all about that. But first of all, let's say hello to Mike and find out a little bit about his background. Mike, welcome to Recovery Coast to Coast. Thanks, Neil. Good evening to you. Hope all's well. Uh, all is well, as a matter of fact. Uh, Mike, you were a, a news guy for about 40 years and, and got out of that profession, and now you're in a situation where you're helping thousands and thousands of people in long-term recovery stand up, speak out, about addiction and about the recovery process. Tell us a little bit about your journey into that, Mike, from, uh, from active addiction into uh, wonderful recovery. Well, the active addiction made me change my career, obviously, uh, working in, in television for all those years. And the way I got involved in advocacy was just about the same time that Faces and Voices of Recovery got started. I would notice that after a number of years when I would, uh, in long-term recovery, when I would meet old friends in the city that I uh, came from, they were still treating me with kid gloves, really didn't know what to say, didn't know how to approach me. And that was kind of the way that it got started. I realized uh, they didn't know, and it really wasn't their fault. It actually was my fault because by my silence, I was letting them define me. And I decided that it's time to speak out to show people that recovery is a possibility and that it does work. 
and how much, not just that people change, but how much they can change. When did you go into recovery? Uh, in 1994 is when I achieved recovery. However, I started in 1982 mm -hmm. and at a period where I was not drinking for about six years. And like so many people, I decided, well, I've got, I now understand this uh, disease. Now that I understand it, I should be able to control it. Well, that certainly was a false assumption. Mm -hmm. So I started all over again for about four years trying to, to prove that I could control it, and I was not successful. So in 1994, I decided this is it. I give up. Were there people along the way, Mike, that tried to get you to realize that, A, you had a problem, and, B, you needed treatment? You know, there were, but I think like so many of us experience, uh, I, I had that attitude of, you know, they really don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember one that I look back on. You know, hindsight is wonderful when you look back at some of the, the uh, well, let's just put stupid things <laughs> that you either say or you think. And I do remember one employer uh, kind of whispered to me that if you don't do something about this problem, you're, you're not going to be able to work here much longer. Now, I was under the influence of alcohol when he told me that, and I remember storming down the hall thinking, what a jerk this guy is accusing me of drinking on the job. And I was. My attitude was, how dare he? And so that was one. And then finally, a little bit later on, after it progressed and became even worse, yes, I did have some really good friends uh, who approached me and uh, attempted to help. And uh, I was still under that attitude that, well, I've done things successfully on my own before. I really don't need their help. I can take care of this. And I really don't have to, to rely on somebody else to do it for me. Did you go into treatment, or did you just go into recovery groups? No, I went into uh, a couple of treatment programs. Uh, first of all, a couple of 28-day treatments. In about a four-year period, I went into a couple of 28-day treatment programs. And uh, again, as I reflect back, uh, they were fine. It was me that was not fine. I was not willing to accept that there was anything that they could tell me. And when we talk about the disease of being progressive, well, it certainly was. It progressed far enough where I had given up uh, my job, my family, my home, and I eventually ended up in a homeless shelter in Louisville, Kentucky, where I, which also at the same time, uh, within just a couple of days after I got there, had uh, was starting a long-term recovery program. And so that's where I finally achieved sobriety, was in that uh, program, which is a six- to nine-month program, and I just stayed. And listened and uh, took action. And actually, I worked there for 13 years after that. Is that right? I stayed and just stayed and just stayed. And uh, finally, they, uh, you know, and it's about the same time that uh, people advocating recovery, there were about five of us that gathered together. Well, somebody else had gathered together, and I joined that group. It just grew so rapidly that I, I had to leave a, the place. It's called the Healing Place in Louisville, Kentucky. I couldn't do both at the same time any longer. And I want to ask you, Mike, we talked about people uh, approaching you about getting well. What about people you have come in contact with since you have been in recovery? What has their reaction been, especially early on with, with Mike Berry now in recovery as opposed to uh, having that so-called problem? Again, when you look back, there were a number of people that were really, really close friends and really good people that continued to be my friends all the way through and still are today. These are people who are not in recovery, uh, don't need to be in recovery, and you know, it's always wonderful to have that type of support. Then there were others who, uh, you know, just as, as we are taught, there were others who just eventually turned their back on me and said, you know, you said that too many times, I no longer believe you. Sure. And 17 years later, they, they still don't believe me, and that's fine, that, that is their choice. And then there are others who have become just really fantastic supporters of the work that we do, seeing uh, what it did for me and how our organization has been able to help others. We talk about addiction as being progressive in a negative sense. Recovery, on the other hand, good, solid recovery, is progressive in a positive sense. Talk about that journey for you following treatment and, and 17 years later and some of the things that happened along the way that brought you to where you are now as the CEO of PAR. I look at it this way, when uh, most of us, 
there might be a little bit of argument here, but we're not born into addiction. We progress into it. Overnight, we just don't decide to become happy, joyous, and free. We progress uh, into our recovery as well. And when we talk about relapse, I look at that the same way. We can progress into a relapse. But if we continue through the recovery process, we continue to grow. And each day I'm amazed by new things that happened and new alliances that are formed and new attitudes for myself that I have and a new way of looking at things that I looked at in the past. And when I look back, my whole outlook on life was just totally skewed. And I look back at it sometimes with humor, sometimes with sadness, but think I just didn't get it. And as I continue to progress today and start meeting more people who are in long-term recovery, how important that is to continue and for us to speak out, plus I think it's really valuable that we include our family and friends and bring them along on the journey because one person can affect so many other people and often uh, the families do get left out in this journey and it's, it's nice to have them along. Mike, tell us about PAR and how that came to be and, and your role in it. When I started the process of realizing that people didn't know how to talk about addiction to me, didn't know how to talk about recovery, uh, there were about five of us that got together for about, about a year, maybe two years, and we were uh, trying to start an organization. At that time, they had a three-person steering committee, and we were meeting in various parts of the state traveling around, and we tried to get people to come, and they, you know, they just weren't, just weren't quite interested, and we just couldn't get it going. And then eventually, uh, we did become a 501c3, a nonprofit organization, tried to expand a little bit, and I became the president of the board. I started traveling a little bit more and speaking out. At about the same time that was going on, I met Pat Taylor, the executive director of Faces and Voices of Recovery, uh, at a conference at which we were both speaking, and it was in Chicago. And I explained to her what I was trying to get going, and it was one of those aha moments when, uh, when Pat said, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Why don't you join us, too? Mm. And so I became a founding board member of Faces and Voices of Recovery. And so the journey has been working together. I served four years on the board of Faces and Voices of Recovery, uh, rotated off for a couple of years, and just uh, this past month rejoined the board again as the Mid-Atlantic representative uh, representing Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and Virginia. And so it's been a growth as we've watched this recovery movement all across the country with just wonderful organizations popping up all over the place and programs like yours to let people know that, hey, recovery is a possibility. It really works. Mike Berry is joining us tonight on Recovery Coast to Coast. He is the CEO of PAR down in Louisville, Kentucky, people advocating recovery. You have managed to mobilize some 5,000 people in recovery or people advocating for recovery. How in the world did you do that, Mike? That, that's one question I'm asked so frequently. Uh, I wish I had the answer. And maybe one of these days it will come to me. But I think it just, you know, going from community to community, along with the support of, uh, you know, everybody else, and what I had learned from Faces and Voices Recovery, just speaking out, being a person willing to talk about their recovery, uh, I think it gives other people permission as well. And so I used all the, the media tools, being a former media person. I used all the media tools, uh, started a website because I have a, a uh, website development company on the side. Now just a half a person works there, which is me. Started using the, the web when it was first available, then jumped on Facebook, and then an e-newsletter. And I think it's just the old thing of uh, if people don't know you're there, they don't know you're there. So you have to give them permission to join you. Mm. Talk about some of the pushback, some of the controversy. You know, many people still don't understand the difference between anonymity and and secrecy uh what we are doing in terms of standing up and speaking out has nothing to do with anonymity or 12-step programs and a lot of people d still don't get that T talk about some of the some of the pushback and some of the way you've been able to educate people in recovery in the early days of the formation of 12-step uh, groups there were people that were speaking out uh there are good policies and, and good traditions about the anonymity to protect others. Bill Wilson and was one of the ones, Bill spoke 
openly about his recovery. He testified in front of Congress. Right. And Marty Mann, and th yes. there were many others. So that precedent was set. And I, I totally agree with and understand the, uh, the anonymity and what it means to 12-step groups and that you don't have a president of this 12-step group or that one and you're not out representing that group because relapse is, uh, is a possibility. And that can have a really negative effect. And there are others who, because of their profession, uh, have a problem with their employer and they can't identify. And so that part is good. That's the anonymity. That's where uh, I respect it as well. Now, as far as my recovery, that's what I talk about. I talk about my recovery, not any uh, membership in any other organization other than people advocating recovery, faces and voices of recovery, groups that talk about their recovery. I don't always talk about, well, I do say how I got here, but I don't describe exactly in detail how I got here, just the fact that I did. So my recovery is absolutely fine if I'm willing to talk about my own. Now, I still have that attitude if I want to respect other people, I will identify people when they belong to my organization, and whether or not they are in recovery, I normally don't say that unless I've heard them say it out loud in public. There's a balance, Neil. You know, you have to, you have to do it, and I respect both sides. Tell me about the Advocacy Training Center and, and what happens there and what you do. We have worked on a whole lot of legislative issues in our state. In Kentucky, we're one of two states left, uh, Virginia being the other, that once a person is convicted of a felony, they lose their right to vote for life unless they get a partial pardon from the governor. But we don't think that's right. A person has accepted their responsibility, paid their dues, and now they are saddled with a felony conviction for the rest of their life. But they're not allowed to vote. They're not allowed to choose how their taxes are spent. And we know that any time you treat a person as a second-class citizen, that the chance of recidivism, it hurts. And so we feel that people uh, need to be integrated back into the community in that way. That's one of the legislative issues. We passed a, a law called Casey's Law that helps with involuntary treatment for adult children uh, that are still uh, being supported by a family. We're getting our penal codes revised for the very first time in the state of Kentucky, which uh, in, a, in a nutshell, will uh, basically the attitude will be treatment before incarceration, which is really terrific. So there are a lot of, there's so much information, so many things going on. And obviously the economy is in tough times right now. And it's difficult for people to come to a city, hotel, other expenses for training. I got a grant that will allow us to take the training to different communities around the state of Kentucky, those that are sometimes underserved or ignored. Many states have pockets that you know aren't around the metropolitan areas, and they often are kind of left out, it seems like. Well, we want to make sure that we get around the entire state and do some of the training on uh, legislative, how to talk to your legislator, how to become an advocate, how to talk about your recovery, how to uh, be, uh, get ready for the Affordable Health Care Act, what that means, introducing recovery coaching. In other words, we're going to take training around the entire state and take it to them instead of making them come to us. Mike Berry is joining us tonight. Back in uh, 1994, he entered long-term recovery. Uh, he is a, a true advocate for the recovery movement. And recently in Washington, D.C., Faces and Voices of Recovery. And by the way, you can find them online at www.facesandvoicesofrecovery.org. They had uh, an, an, an honor that they present. It's a, a series of honors, America Honors Recovery. And one of the people who received the distinguished Vern Johnson Award this year was Mike Berry. Mike, talk about what that award means to you and to your recovering community. I think that's the important part. You hit it right there, what it means to the recovery community. Uh, being an old television person, we thrived on awards. Every award you could get to get your name out there. And this award... Uh, was such an honor, and it, it, and it took me, it, I'm, I'm sh not sure it's even sunk in yet, 
it took me a while because when we talk about recovery and how we change, that was one of the things that, that really changed to me was no longer having to seek those personal awards to validate my worthiness or my existence. So I still look at this award, and I'm sure I will always do the same way, <clears throat> that yes, it was nice to be honored. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, it was nice to be honored. But I accepted the award on behalf of uh, our organization, People Advocating Recovery, and all those who have supported us over the years, the families, the friends, and anybody who is in recovery. Again, it shows these type of awards. It shows that recovery is a possibility and that it works. I want you to give out your website, and I also want to give out the website of Faces and Voices, because if you have not, for some reason, heard about Faces and Voices of Recovery, you certainly should. That's www.facesandvoicesofrecovery.org. What is your website for PAR, Mike? PeopleAdvocatingRecovery.org. That's a pretty simple way to say it. Uh, That's exactly it. I congratulate you and the recovering community down in Louisville, Kentucky, for all that you have done and all that you will continue to do, uh, one recovery person at a time. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. Thank you, Neil. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed my 2011 interview with the great Mike Berry, who sadly passed away on February 28th. His legacy of hope and resilience, that will continue. By the way, I want to remind listeners of this podcast that if you would like to tell your story of recovery, regardless of the path that you've chosen, and as long as you've been in continuous recovery for a year or more, drop us a note at recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Coming up next, actor Luke Gossett Jr. with Reflections on Recovery and Truth and Trust. Are you afraid? Afraid of life without drugs and alcohol? There is help and hope at Sundown M Ranch. At Sundown, the focus is on you and your disease. You will learn how to live without depending on drugs and alcohol. Sundown M Ranch is nationally recognized for effective and affordable alcohol and drug treatment programs. Reclaim your life. Replace your fears with hope. Go to www.sundown.org right now to learn more. And now, as promised, some thoughts on truth and trust in recovery from award-winning actor and a man in long-term recovery himself, Lou Gossett, Jr. Broken promises, denial, excuses, exaggerations, lies upon lies upon lies. That's how many of us grew up. In our household, fiction rather than fact was the norm. We wouldn't have recognized truth if it stared us in the eye. Our parents lied to each other and for each other. It seemed that they preferred lies to truths, and we followed right along. The whole family lied to hide or sidestep drunkenness, violence, irresponsibility, or other unpleasant realities. We as youngsters lied to get attention, to avoid punishment, to survive. If we didn't grow out of these ingrained habit patterns, we paid a heavy price as adults. Because our lies became even more widespread, it was impossible to keep track of them. We feared getting caught, and often it was unavoidable. People stopped trusting and respecting us. Worse, we no longer trusted or respected ourselves. Needless to say, it's exceedingly difficult to break these lifelong habits. We feel naked and vulnerable without our armor of deceit. Yet we want to move forward, and we know that our ability to function in the world will be severely limited if we don't take actions to become honest and above board in all our affairs. Thought for today? There were times when it seemed that dishonesty made life simpler. I've since learned that nothing is more simple than the truth. Now, before we close out the podcast, I do want to share a poem that I wrote about Mike Berry. He's been a longtime friend, and I was stunned by his uh, passing. This podcast is dedicated to his memory. The poem, it's called Mike Berry, Agent of Change. A poem in tribute to Mike Berry, true agent of change. As an agent of change, he did so much for so many for so long. Let his memory be an enduring monument for standing up and speaking out, sprinkling kindness with serenity, acceptance, courage, and knowledge. 
His kindness was contagious. His love unfaltering. His legacy was unconditional love. Now he lay beneath the American flag, front and center, as mourners bid adieu to a man for the many with integrity in the first degree. Mike is gone, but he's left us with parting gifts and a treasure map that we can all follow towards tomorrow, but just for today. The gift of faith, the gift of hope, the gift of optimism, the gift of laughter, and the immeasurable gift of enduring love for one another. He was as much a student as he was a teacher, and his teaching created change. With his arms and his heart wide open, and laughter is the liniment on the highway from hope to healing. He believed in me. He believed in you. And together, we must pay it forward, believing in others as he believed in us, loving others until they can love themselves with the concern, compassion, and simple kindness that paved his personal path. Father of life, mother of love, welcome home your spiritual son, sustained with simple sobriety into the big hall, far beyond our earthly comprehension, a man well-loved, a life well-lived. May we all strive to be agents of change. Well, that wraps up this edition of Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. If you've enjoyed our podcast, and we certainly hope you have, please share it with others via social media or simply by telling someone about it. You can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. If you'd like to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address, recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. Also, we invite you to hit the subscribe or follow button. It's free, and you'll be notified the next time we publish a podcast. Remember, if you know someone who is experiencing problems with alcohol or any other drug, here's a 24-hour national helpline that offers free information and confidential treatment referrals. Spanish-speaking individuals are available as well. The number is 1-800-622-HELP. And we encourage you to check out findsupport.gov. It's a relatively new website designed for individuals, families, and friends. They have a lot of information, including how to pay for treatment, including low-cost and, in some cases, free treatment options. Find health care support, including how to help someone else or find help for yourself. It's all in one place, findsupport.gov. And join us next time for America's Voice for Recovery, Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast. Another shout out to our sponsoring organization, the good folks at Sundown M Ranch, where recovery begins, sundown.org. I'm Neil Scott reminding you to stay healthy, live in gratitude, and be kind to others. Remember, the bright side of addiction is recovery. Pass it on.